How'd you like to listen to .NET Rocks with no ads? Easy. Become a patron. For just $5 a month, you get access to a private RSS feed where all the shows have no ads. $20 a month will get you that and a special .NET Rocks patron mug. Sign up now at patreon.netrocks.com. Hey, Carl and Richard here. As you may have heard, NDC is back, offering their incredible in-person conferences around the world. And we'd like to tell you about them. NDC Oslo will be May 21st through the 25th. Go to ndcoslo.com to register. NDC Copenhagen is happening August 27th through the 31st. Go to ndccopenhagen.com for more information. NDC Porto is happening October 16th through the 20th. The early bird discount for NDC Porto ends July 21st. Go to ndcporto.com to register. And check out the full lineup of conferences at ndcconferences.com. Hey, welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Kemp. In our respective hiding holes. For the moment, at least. Trying to bear this crazy winter that finally showed up. Oh, did you get a cold one too, dude? Oh, yeah. We had a we had a cold snap here. Nice. And it's just coming out of it now. Uh, we got a foot and a half of snow overnight. You're crazy. I know. I, what do you guys do in snow? Uh, we, uh, you don't have snow. We don't have snow. No, uh, no, uh, you have rain. You know, we got out there, we got out there and shoveled. Yeah. That would have been a perfectly fine evening rainfall, but nope. It turned into white stuff and stuck. So you actually have snow shovels. They sell them. Oh yeah. <laughs> Are there yep. plows? Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Not very many. No, and it took, it took 24 hours for the cul-de-sac to get plowed. It's funny. The, the West coast and the South typically of, you know, of North America don't typically get snow and no. they're. They're like, what is this? I yeah. was in Pasadena right. when it held on them earlier this week, and everyone was just in shock. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> Whoa. Well, yeah. What was that sound? Oh, that was Brian Foster. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Richard. But even if it rains in Los Angeles, the response is, near as I can tell, when you see rain, get in your car, take it to the highway, and park it. <laughs> All right. Enough of this small talk. Let's get right into it with Better Know Framework. Awesome. <laughs> All right, man, what do you got? Well, it's a new story. Ooh. No longer the new IE, Apple Safari 16.4 to bring 135 new features. What the? I know. Well, I just love that somebody else is using my line. Yeah. Well, I think <laughs> some. I, they must listen to this show, the new yeah. IE, because not only did they uh, you know, say all of this stuff, but they said, the likely reason for Apple's hesitancy over implementing web technology is that it helps to ensure that apps for iOS are delivered by the App Store, a major profit center for the company. Yeah. See, somebody else mm-hmm. gets it too. Uh, mm-hmm. But some of these, uh, I'll, I'll just tell you what the features are. Mm-hmm. Uh, web push notifications, that's big. Yeah. So for progressive web apps, uh, we can have notifications even on the Apple Watch. How about that? Wow. Okay. That is a big deal. That's a huge deal. That means that progressive web applications are actually viable again. Remember, I was just lamenting that yeah, a while ago. Just, just broken. Um, Shadow DOM, meaning uh, scoped CSS. Nice. Support for lazy loading iframes. New JavaScript features like import maps, a WebAssembly SIMD support, and numerous web animation features and fixes. And they go into detail in this article about uh, each one of those things. So it sounds like a big catch up. About freaking time. Yeah. Big old catch up. Yeah. Um, and they also say that the, the shift may have to do with the new legislation that, uh, the, the EU Digital Markets Act mm. potentially impacts Apple policies. Um, but even so, I think, I, I hope the non cynical me hopes that. They just came to their senses and said, you know, we don't want to be the new IE. Yeah. So maybe they were listening to you, Richard, <laughs> and me, and got a hint. Yeah, maybe. And yeah. Got the hint. But, it, you know, or somebody finally said, we should just keep up with standards. Like, it's not helping yeah. anybody in the end. Right. At, at best. You, you know, Apple's already got their walled garden effect where each other's, their products work really well with each other more so than anything else. Right. You don't have to be more difficult than that. Right. Please. Please. So anyway, I'm, I'm really happy about this news and, uh, 
Know it, learn it, love it. Who's talking to us, Richard? Hey, I grabbed a comment off of show 179, which we did back in April of 22 with our friend Chris Klug. Yeah. We were talking when he was comparing all the different infrastructure as code strategies. And that, right. of course, naturally led into a DevOps and a pipeline sort of conversation with the tooling. Mm-hmm. And I thought it would tie in nicely with our conversation today. But this comment comes from Devin Goble, which is back in uh, May of 22. He made this comment where he said, my hot take on DevOps is that too many practitioners start off with rigid preconceived notions of what they want to do. This is normal. Uh-huh. Our decision making is always going to be shaped by our scars. Remember that? Yeah. Term? Yep. However, it helps to approach DevOps technology as any technology with an open mind. Start by looking for whether or not the out-of-box functionality is sufficient, and if not, why? Uh. Here's my favorite line. Are the scars running the show? <laughs> You'll love that. Is old pain holding you back? Yeah, is old, yeah, it's old pain dictating the plan. <laughs> yeah. right? There's always going to be some amount of custom work that needs to be done. But if our first step is always to start by figuring out how to get the pipeline to run a custom bash or PowerShell script, you're probably doing it wrong. Yeah. (laughs) You aren't that special. Yep. Right. Uh, If the can features can get you most, if not all the way there, start with those. They are almost always going to provide decent error handling, logging, and parameter checking, especially if they're first-party offerings. Keep in mind that there's going to be some differences between greenfield projects and lift and shift that might still require some extra work. I like to think about it for most any cloud project. If step one is to create an Azure VM and install SQL Server, you're going down the wrong path. Right. (laughs) <laughs> Fair enough, uh, Devin. Yeah. I appreciate your thinking. And uh, I think we're all in violent agreement with you, actually. Absolutely. You, know, I, you don't want 100%. 100% is unlikely. But 80% is a given. Right. And so, you know, find the 80% case and then at least see that there's enough room to do the customizations you need to do. And that the customizations aren't going to punish you for the rest of your life in the process. Uh, so thanks so much for your comment and a copy of Music to Go By is on its way to you. And if you'd like a copy of Music to Go By, write a comment on the website at donnetrocks.com or on the Facebooks. We publish every show there. And if you comment there and I read it on the show, we'll send you a copy of Music to Go By. Yeah. And the Facebooks, like, like you get that at Walmarts. Yes. It's like mom speak. By going through the internet tubes. <laughs> the internets. Yes. Uh, yeah. So by the way, um, uh, Mastodon is where somebody tooted me about oh, this man. new, th- stuff in uh coming in safari you got tooted how about that i got tooted nice. man so yeah i'm enjoying my my tutors the my followers on mastodon a, a lot there's a lot more engagement than on twitter so you should follow us on mastodon i'm at carl franklin at techhub.social and i'm rich campbell at mastodon.social and send us a toot because you know sometimes that's how we learn things that we talk about mm. on the show all good stuff all right Let's, uh, you heard him before chime in there, but let me formally introduce Brian. Brian Foster currently works at Microsoft as a senior cloud solutions architect and a mentor for the Microsoft Founders Hub, which we definitely have to talk about. His career started as a full stack.net engineer and grew to various leadership roles from team lead to CTO. Brian found a passion for building teams and cultures that focus on cultivating developer velocity. He loves the development community and appreciates how it has helped his career over the years. So he decided to give back by co-founding the Salt Lake Azure Group in 2018. When Brian's not coding, you can find him either in his wood shop or in the mountains trying to hide from the cell service. Oh, don't we all need that <laughs> once in a while? Sometimes it's some long hikes. <laughs> yeah. Well, welcome to the show, Brian. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You bet. Yeah, what is this uh, Microsoft Founders Hub? That's an intriguing name. Yeah, it's a program Microsoft started to kind of just help startups embrace technology and to give them the advantage to start and not to be held back from technology because it can be a kind of a daunting experience, daunting uh, learning curve to get into, especially if you're non-technical mm. in that startup. And so uh, us as, as employees of Microsoft, we've been given the opportunity to volunteer and kind of mentor those. And really comes down to some awesome conversations rarely are technology driven in that sense but more just how do we how do you swim through this lane of technology yeah good that's good so uh, yeah i appreciate that especially for um non-techie people who are starting companies that's a that's a great service it's kind of fun to talk to those uh clients and kind of 
foreshadow what's happening, what's coming down the road. You know, we had some big things coming with chat GPT recently. I don't know if mm-hmm. you guys have heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> I, Maybe you've I'm, heard of it. <laughs> yeah. I'm probably honestly the only human being in the world that hasn't actually used it yet. Uh, I was using it yesterday. Yeah. It but, didn't know, help, but it tried really <laughs> hard, but it's information was too old. Yeah. And, and and so it, it gives those people understanding that what to take the proper steps moving forward. What's the next best step? It's going to outlast uh, for a while and not have to come back. You know, we talk about those scars and that comment. And, you know, that I always relate to that as pain driven development. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> why, why self inflict some of those pains and those scars if you don't have to? But so they give you resources from Azure, they give you Azure credits along as referencing with these knowledge experts. Uh, they give you credits through GitHub and partnerships we have with Microsoft as well. So, uh, utilizing some of those SaaS offerings to just give you that edge that normally you probably wouldn't think of as a startup, um, but to then take advantage of that and go, hey, here's some new possibilities. Wasn't there a program called BizSpark that was like this? Yeah. 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 That was kind of like the start of, of where this is at. So it's like the great grandfather of this program. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So BizSpark was the old way and now there's a new way. Yeah. And, and they have it in like a tiered setup. So if you're just kind of like an ideation of a startup, you can apply up to almost going to production, so to speak, and mm-hmm. not, you know, right before you get your funding or going public. Um, so you have these different tiers and each tier correlates with a larger cost uh, for Azure credits, a larger sure. headcount for GitHub, uh, Dynamics 365 and their CRM services. And so you really, we, it's that journey. I think a lot of people, you know, as you get into the cloud, it, it's a learning journey. And we hold that startup and help those startup founders go through that whole process from just ideas and where you go to actually implementing those ideas into the cloud and what technologies to use and how to best, you know, solution their products. So you're not even necessarily looking for technology people at all. Just if you want to start a business, they could be talking to founders. Yeah. Out. Yeah. Huh. I, I worked with a company uh, in Atlanta startup and really what they did was help people consume remote work since COVID started. You know, you have a lot of people that don't even know where to start. Right. And so they came up with packages and, uh, and kind of tutorials of how to even get going, how to set up microphones, what quality of microphones and web cameras and laptops and certain programs and where they sit. And a lot of that uh, conversations we had with them is how to scale out, how to handle scale because they're like, right. I can't do it by myself. And so you can, you talk about a little bit of technology, how we could scale out and their offerings digitally um, and, and things like that. So it, I enjoy it because it's the human aspect of technology mm-hmm. where I think it really brings that spice of life to our, to our field yeah, and that innovation aspect. So you mentioned in your bio the word velocity. What does that actually mean to you? Well, for one, it does not mean judging developers' work during their sprint. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> what? K-Lox is not a good measure of developer yeah. productivity? What? Uh, yeah. You know, I, that was one thing when everyone's like, hey, we got to make sure everyone's programming fast and they're, they're hitting XYZ. And I'm like, yeah, that, you can't do that. <laughs> it's hard. You know, humans are hard. Sometimes you're working on harder mm-hmm. projects than easier projects and you make more progress. To me, yeah. developer velocity uh, is how to get your how do you get your ideations into the cloud faster or into fruition. And what I mean by that is, you know, you always have those like kind of water cooler talks, and those that have been in departments for a while, they're like, oh, it'd be really cool to do I- idea X Y Z. But how do we get started? And there's certain roadblocks built into the corporation or just through the history of how we handle IT infrastructure and development to where. You know, maybe you can't get to those resources uh, allocated quick enough. And that kind of idea and that inspiration kind of passes by because life moves on, work comes, more pain driven developments coming. Uh, right. And you lose that priority. So I look at it as how do I get a developer from e- whether they be new or into the company to produce code and be a productive member of society in our department? Uh, yeah, just getting someone set up that's new to the team to a point where they can check a bit of code in and it actually mm-hmm. shows up in the system. I, often it's not a trivial problem like no unless you've really worked on it like i've seen organizations get to a point where it's like in a matter of hours we can build out a dev box and have you able to check code in but Mm -hmm. you have to have spent time building that to make that that quick and i've spent a lot of time doing that myself as well where that's what's kind of spiked these interests like how can i simplify this make it faster but yet flexible you know i think that's a key too is a lot of these earlier day situations are very confined in how we do it. Like this is your image. This is how you program. Good luck. But we know as software is coming out every week and new releases, we have to kind of stay updated with that too. So you have to have that flexibility of keeping that environment moving forward with progression. 
Mm. You, do you, have you noticed um, uh, intimidation or imposter syndrome, those kinds of psychological things holding people back when you know they can, if they just relaxed and, you know, head down, figure some things out and, and everything yeah. will be okay? I think 100%. I think, honestly, we all face it. I've faced it myself with almost every new position I've, I've gotten. Yeah. Because you, as humans, you don't want to fail. You know, you, we seem to look down at that in a negative sense. Um, you know, we, we come with compensation from our employment. And you're like, man, if I, you know, don't succeed here, do I, can I really justify that compensation? Like, it almost is outside of the development realm. And so, yeah. I think it's, you know, to set up a safe area. For developers, it's it's key in leadership to be able to say, hey, look, we have this built in a way where you can go and make mistakes huh. and we're not going to be uh, mad about it. We also set up it's systems critical. where we're not going to be hard about it. Yeah. Um, that's critical hardship. to fail and, and yeah. learn from it. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. You know, and there's that statement, uh, quick to fail. I, I like to kind of modify and say quick to fail smartly. Like, mm -hmm. let's assess what we're going into. Let's assess... Uh, you know, where our code is, how we're going to deploy, if we're going to deploy and, and be prepared for any of the negative outcomes. Quick to recover from failure. Yeah. 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 yeah in fact, that I, I think that's a better policy because when, when the cost of failure is really low, you'll be more experimental. Like you'll move faster because the breaking things part is not that big of a deal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, modern day development too, a lot of it is focused in the cloud, you know, whatever mm -hmm. cloud provider you're using. And so a lot of us, uh, you know, you come into the cloud, your first, from my experience and from what I've seen from a lot of engineers, their first experience getting in the cloud is through the portal, like through the web UI. Uh -huh. And you're clicking on things and dragging. And, and they do, like Azure specifically does a fantastic job of building a UX where it's, even if you're not an infrastructure knowledgeable person, you can build out app services or Azure functions uh -huh. decently quick and kind of know what's going on. They have a great breadcrumbing through a uh, menu you to go through and yep. to, to build that out. But at the same time, it's human interaction. And what are one thing that humans are really good at are just making mistakes because it happens. Right. You know, uh, I always love how Microsoft's like, oh, we're, the elasticity in the cloud of being able to scale up and scale down and set those scales is so easy. Like it is, but it's also really easy to scale all the way up to the highest level price skew and forget yep. about it through the week and let it yeah. run through the don't, weekend and go. Don't worry, you'll find out. You'll find out all about it soon enough. Yeah, I know a little third, about that. Yeah. yeah, 30 days later, they're like, hey, what's, you know, a company comes to you and goes, what's this bill? And you're like, I have no idea. Let me go so, find out. Why do I yeah. owe $20,000 this month? Yeah. 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 It's my backdoor crypto mining. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and that, that could be scary for our new employees, right? If you're new to the, the company, say six months and you do something like that and they come in back like, hey, here's this cost. It's just scary. And a lot of those new newcomers are young in the field as well. And so they don't even necessarily have that experience of making those mistakes. And I think that's even a, a steeper threshold of worry. Right. So you, you spend a bit of time teaching cloud governance, I bet. Yeah. Yeah. I think that cloud governance too expands more just from the developer. I mean, Richard, I know with your background in, in managing hardware and IT, yeah. you know, in enterprise levels, it's kind of a, a fight against developers and IT management sometimes. I've seen some yeah. companies where I stick with that mindset. I mean, I'd never blame a developer for the fact that they were able to leave a bunch of infrastructure on that they didn't need. That's mm -hmm. on IT. Mm -hmm. You know, infrastructure be, ogres yeah, versus it developer shouldn't be possible. Fairies. Yeah, right. They yeah, they, 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 that should have been caught and cleaned up. Yeah, um, and it. It's, and I, but that's also I don't want them to be afraid. Like I want yeah. them to have the confidence of go ahead, fire up as much stuff as you want. Mm -hmm. You know, but you're going to have to fight hard to keep it alive more than the end of today. Yeah. Like that should be the hard part is leaving stuff on, not leaving stuff off. Yeah. And and I think that's the natural evolution too of like infrastructure's code uh, as that started to come out, um, you know, back to the comments about all the different offerings, you know, it, we, even as those that manage the cloud, they don't want to manually bring up storage accounts and VMs and virtual networks for every request. I've yeah, seen tough. that where we've had enterprise co companies, large companies, where you talk to the developers about building out this idea, this project, this innovation, my air quotes here, this app application innovation. And they're like, well, that's great, but I need to throw a, a note over to IT to build out this infrastructure. And that's a two-week turnaround. Yeah. And then we'll have access to it. And you're like, oh, man. Because well, like, it used to be a nine-month turnaround. Like, IT's yeah. feeling pretty good about being able to deliver that in two weeks. <laughs> when the, And yeah. the reality is it should be a minute. Yeah. Right? yeah. It has to be self-service. 
Well, and you think of the, if you were to prioritize your daily work tasks and what you want to do, newing up resources in the cloud for people's requests, I'm sure probably bottom on your list of doing that day in and day out. And if you could take that 10% of repetitiveness and automate that, you can now stack that free 10% on top of your priority list and start working on things that will drive business value for your department or for your role or or responsibilities. Is there tooling around that whole self-service idea? There's some tooling. I, I, we're starting to formalize uh, some of those toolings. You know, we talk about infrastructure's code and running it through, say, like an Azure CLI mm-hmm. or starting to run it in CI CD, but it's still kind of fragmented amongst the teams. Right. It's, you know, someone always seems to control it and because they know it. I think that's one thing that's kind of key in this DevOps side is mm. you get certain people to kind of overlap responsibilities because they're like, I need to know a little bit about CI CD for my development. So I'm going to learn infrastructure's code. Infrastructure code starts to dip into knowing infrastructure, which now I need to bring in my IT people, right? So there's a little bit of fragmentation there. Um, but Microsoft is is done really well, and they've actually recently released a uh, new resource, a new concept in the cloud called uh, Azure Deployment Environments. And this kind of c- encapsulates all those uh, theories, methodologies, and process and tooling to automate these processes and to actually join those developers, the developer manager, and the IT management teams together. Because I think that's huge in, in the culture as well of, of even DevOps being successful and development teams being successful is communication. Letting us all know we're all on the same team here. So how do we work together? How do we evolve together and bring that business value? And so, right. at, you know, an Azure deployment environments is fantastic. It's, it's a concept. Um, the specific resources that come into the cloud is called the Dev Center. And that Dev Center is where you can come in and you can kind of manage the infrastructure's code, what we call catalogs. And that contains all the infrastructure's code for these specific projects. And then on top of that, you can manage um, the certain environments that these are going to, because on top of mean, making sure you're in the proper virtual networks, you need to worry about that the people that are in them are authorized to use those resources. Right. You know, from your various environments of, of development to QA to staging, you're going to have various roles that are going to need different permissions and potentially you don't want the developer into the QA environment or sure. you don't want anyone in the staging environment because you want to keep that, you know, its own thing, make sure what's going out in production mm. is what's going on protection is not modified from the single source of truth of the, you know, CICD, those pipelines being built. And so in dev center, you can set up those environments and then you can set those RBAC permissions and who has availability for those. And so then what I'll, what you can do from a dev, dev manager perspective is you can execute these, uh, environments to, uh, you know, build out the sandbox environments automatically. One thing we see in deployment procedures uh, is you branch from features of your projects. So you could have multiple dozens of projects going on at once that's uh-huh. for that same core application, you know, different features. Or when's when that bug, you know, bug in production hits it Tuesday at two o'clock in the afternoon and needs to be fixed ASAP. Right. We halt all work, right? And then we're like, okay, let's focus on this bug fix. Let's get it back into production. The Dev Center gives you that ability to scaffold out a whole environment for that bug fix, fix it, deploy, you know, down with your CI/CD staging, as well as um, bringing that bug fix down in the code repositories for your, say, your Dev environments, because it's going to need that updated code. And so you have a lot of agility there in these environments. You're not sitting there personally building out Azure infrastructure, you know, by hand. You're setting up resources and functions and uh, app services and whatnot. So we have that automated process. Sounds just like the natural evolution of source control to me. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's more on like the infrastructure side of on it. On the infrastructure side. Yeah. Now, and you could be feeding these deployment environments from GitHub Actions. Yes. You can, uh, GitHub Actions are these, uh, infrastructure's code files are stored in a code repository, whether it be GitHub or Azure DevOps. And uh, we have a manifest file inside the structure that kind of points out what files belong and, and kind of gives it some order. And that's how the dev center is, re- you know, uh, recognizing these files in that structure. But, you know, behind an Azure and that control plane, as we know, everything is spoken to at that ARM level, at Azure resource manager level mm-hmm. in those files. And so whether you're running it from a CI CD process or Azure CLI, it's always going to go through that layer. And, you know, currently we only support ARM templates, but this is a public preview resource that just came out in October. 
but we're we're looking and aiming at Terraform and being kind of a first class citizen as well. Oh, okay, mm-hmm. great. So it, it's kind of exciting. We're 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 encompassing all flavors of infrastructure's code. You know those popular flavors. Pulumi too, I guess, is on that list. Yeah, and bring everyone in to you know welcome them to the cloud. I guess to say you know we, yeah we're not the the Microsoft of old. Yes, that's true. Yeah, and when I when I hear Azure Arm, I think Bicep these days. I, I as well. I, I rarely type in JSON arm, you know, what we had back in the day, usually it's bicep, which I feel yeah. like is a good middle person between arm and Terraform. Uh, right. I stick to bicep mainly because all of my work is in Azure. Yeah. And so it's just a personal decision of mine. But yeah, Terraform will slowly, uh, quickly become a first class citizen when there's GAs later this year. Yeah, I, I think of bicep mostly because I know the the listeners are programmers and bicep is more programmy and less yeah. um yamily, shall yeah. we say. Yeah, you well, you said the Y word. <laughs> <laughs> no one liked YAML, said no one ever. <laughs> 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 uh, or I like YAML, said no one yeah, ever. Right. There's your quote. Yeah. But um yeah, bicep like when infrastructure's code started years ago. As a developer, you quickly kind of get into that object-oriented mindset of like, oh, I want to build out a lot of functions. How do I build out multiple functions? You know, before there was looping and those type of things, you're like, well, you have to have a separate function file. You recall the file multiple times. Uh So you always had to kind of introduce scripting into that sense as well. But now, you know, breaking out your modules, we kind of call it like a bifurcated uh, infrastructure repository Mm -hmm. where... In a sense, before Dev Center, you could have a repository that stored your infrastructure uh, IAC files for networking and for VMs and kind of bring out that sandbox guardrails. And then, you know, maybe a, a generic app service. But then a project itself, as a developer is working on it, may have infrastructure's code files for their particular function or app service. And the details that go into that, maybe it's a certain TLS setting, custom domains type configuration, auto scale rules. Um, you know, we'll have, you know, auto scale rules specifically could be different for every app service. Right. So why would you want to maintain that from like a core spot where it's the same across the board? You mm-hmm. want that flexibility. And so you could have those inside each project repository. And then when your CI CD starts to execute and you're starting to release this code, um, you bring in the big building blocks from your management IAC repo and you bring in the building blocks from the project IAC and combine those two together to then build out to that infrastructure if necessary. So you you have both plane at hand, right? You have your, your infrastructure management plane at hand as well as the developer's agility plane at hand here for that success. Because even I as a developer, uh, I, I get over my skis really quick when it comes to infrastructure and making sure everything's secure and where we need to go. You know, I really want to focus on the code right. and on the application. But at the same time, we can't just have our blinders on and just say, I'm coding, I'm deploying. It works on my machine. Let me continue going. Mm. Right. That's the statement of 2002. It works on my <laughs> machine. Right. And so. before that, yeah. But it, it feels <laughs> to me like most devs would be able to take a branch, do some modif- do their work, get it running on their machine, Merge to the branch. Somebody else picks up the PR. As soon as that PR happens, the GitHub action kicks off. And now it's up in the pipeline, sitting in the deployment environment, waiting for the next step, essentially. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Pretty now, much, yeah. QA is now going to take it out for a spin, maybe do their own set of tests and so forth, or it's ready to go to staging. And then and somebody else is going to push it into production. Yeah, and that's the thing. is like Once you build the code and ready to deploy, the question is, is where are you deploying it? Where is it going to sit in the cloud? Are yeah. we going to manually build out those infrastructure, you know, those environments uh, for QA? Well, goodness knows you wouldn't want a GitHub action just pushes to the production app service. I mean, who would do that? <laughs> Nobody does no, that. No, no. Oh, that wait, did you skip the whole pull request part? You just simply push to master? Is that what you did? <laughs> oh, okay. I just opened up Visual Studio and said, right click deploy. So yeah. I-, <laughs> <laughs> I worked on a project get- where it was a requirement to have a pull request that had to be approved by a guy who only worked on the project three days a week. Oh, boy. And they wondered why I was going so slow. Yeah. 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 Especially if he's on vacation or, you know, gets hit yeah. by a bus, you're in a hard, tough situation. Yeah, it was tough. And then they and finally um, said, no, just go ahead. Just forget that. <laughs> We're going to remove that request. Going to remove just that it. block. Well, and to me, it's not even that. It, it's that you didn't get the code out there. Like, yeah. 
Now you're going to work on several other things before any of that stuff gets checked in. It just makes merge merging terrible. Merging gets terrible. Yep. And if there is a problem, it's out of your head. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Like you, you got to start over basically. Yeah. Wasn't fun. No. And And folks, before we continue, I've got some very important messages to share. And we're back. It's Don and Rocks. I'm Richard Campbell. That's Carl Franklin. Woot, woot, toot, toot. Talking to our friend Brian Foster a bit about this idea of development velocity as a as a metric around DevOps, like keeping folks iterating fast. And I mentioned just before the break there, this whole idea of like, I want that code you just worked on still in your head. So as soon as I can get problems back to you, the quicker they're going to be able to fix them. Yeah, yeah. I think that that agility is key, right? That's where the innovation comes from, is that being able to to be nimble. Um, and, and to test these type of concepts, too. I know you had a previous uh, guest on, uh, Tom Kirkhove, who yep. talked mm-hmm. about APIM. And in part of his conversation, he talked about Azure load testing. And this is kind of a scenic tour. But Azure load testing is a fantastic resource to come out to start doing that agile testing quicker mm-hmm. at load, right? Right. There's nothing. Nothing like building some. I've been there. You know, you follow, say, NED Frameworks, Hello World tutorials, and you kind of start building that out, and you're interacting with your data, and it works. And when you go into uh, production, all of a sudden, at volume, it just kind of blows up on you. And there's no way to mimic uh, production environments on a local machine, let alone in like a uh, dev environment. And with a resource like uh, Azure Load Testing, you can throw all kinds of instance engines at it and get to that production level volume coming through. Yeah. So though it's a slight cynic route, it still kind of aligns uh, with that velocity, right? To get that feedback and that data back to understand, hey, are we ready to go to production? Did we handle this properly? Sure. It's kind of key there. I, I mean, I'm, and there's load test to failure, but there's also load test to performance or load test to requirements. You know, for me, again, wearing my IT hat, it's like, I don't care that the app's now slower. I care that I provision enough for Saturday. Mm -hmm. And so running it through the load tester to compare last week's version to this week's version at least tells me I need to provision 10% more to get the same uh, overall support for the previous week. And you you don't want to find that out in production either, the site's tipping over because we didn't provision sufficiently. Yeah. Well, it's always Dave the coder's fault when that happens. You're oh, it's always the coder's Dave. fault. Everything's the coder's <laughs> fault. Dave, <laughs> you do. That's become the running joke in my house. Anytime technology doesn't work, my wife and I say I blame the programmers. Yeah, yeah, yeah we call him George. George, George, the developer. But, but I think another flexibility perspective too of of Azure deployment environments in this Dev Center is handling the various environments of a development department within a company, right? Whether you are a small company with say a solo dev or a small team of devs that are ready just to build on their laptops and kind of work from their machines and program to remote workers. Because then you you bring in an, another security aspect there is you have people off premise connecting into your infrastructure, connecting into your code base that are working on these things, which I'm sure set off some red flags and red alerts for people. And then you have you know offshore development, contract development. Or how do you, you know, onboard these people for these various projects quickly so you, they can start working towards it? And then what happens when they leave? You know, you don't want necessarily that code running on their machine and they go, I see you later, Richard. I, I quit on a Tuesday and I just Yikes. took all your proprietary <laughs> knowledge there, right? And that code. And so Dev Center with the combination of another attribute called uh, a resource called Azure DevBox plays a big part in this velocity. It's kind hmm. of just another brick on the stack here to increase that velocity. DevBox is something as well has come out recently uh, over the last year and is in still public preview, but is a environment for a virtual environment for developers focused on the developer, long lasting state and sense of working on that project. You know, you can customize that um, image for your development environment. So whether you're using Visual Studio or you're using some JetBrains products, hmm. um, Certain licenses, I think that's key when, when we talk about, you know, it worked on my machine. It usually comes down to, you know, different NPM uh, versions hmm. or different framework versions, right? And someone's machine just randomly updates because you're like, oh, yeah, accept all updates and make my machine the best it can be. And then all of a sudden all the projects break because now you have, you know, newer versions of, the, of these libraries. Uh-huh. And so now you can have like that consistent developer environment across the board for specific features. 
Um, you know, maybe you have a project you're working on where you're starting to update these libraries. But again, that bug scenario comes in and you're like, oh, I need to work on this bug. What, what are the current steps now? Current, it's like, well, let me relicense or knock down the versions of these frameworks or let me pull out a whole nother repository and kind of retweak my machine. Um, now we don't have to necessarily do that because we have these dev boxes. And wow. in, a, in a middle ground between that has been containers. I mean, I would be a fool not to bring in containers. You right. know, every project should be in a container, in my opinion. Yeah. Because it, it helps alleviate this scenario we're talking about, right? How to onboard a new dev, how to get various developers' machines running this project. You know, you use a, a container, but that's at the, the project level. And so how do we expand that? So you're talking about a container for the dev environment? Well, not necessarily for the dev environment, but for their code base. Sorry. So for yeah, okay. a container on the project. Yeah. You know, before with containers, we had those versioning issues all the time. Sure. And I think it ran on my machine was more of a, a bold statement and very common. Then we bring right. in containers to the project to kind of alleviate that issue, right? To where I can run on my Mac, you could run on your Windows machine, and we can build the same project because it's based out of that container. But to me, the containers really brought the manifest mindset. Really, it catalyzed as opposed to petized the the workloads right mm -hmm. that we're used to just generating the workload from scratch again remake this machine not catalyze c a t a but yeah. cattle c a t t l e yes. dash these are, these are yep. cattle not pets yeah we say it all the time yeah treat your infrastructure like cattle not pets no yeah. no pretty naming yeah kill you know? it well kill it and recreate it on demand right yeah so that yep. you know the the infrastructure is code the manifest of the container is the source of truth because there's yeah. nothing you in there anymore. When you restarted, but I think this is very different from like, am I wrong? DevBox is virtual desktop configured for developers. No, you're, you're kind of spot on there. It's a slight evolution of it, but yeah. yeah. And we, we create these dev pools that work for these specific projects that you've built in your dev center, right? And your project is associated to a specific infrastructure's code uh, catalog that's going to build out that environment. So again, feature X on project A. Yeah. And you can have multiple people working on feature X. And then while you're working on feature X, you know, bug A comes in and you got to work on that. So you have multiple dev boxes running for each specific uh, situation. Sure. And so you have these dev pools coming around and, but it's managed from, you know, uh, those that are responsible for managing infrastructure and, and kind of what those images should be. But just like an AVD, you're generating a compute, uh, you go in the compute gallery, you know, you're building a custom image or a golden image for these dev boxes. Right. And then you're assigning these specific images to these projects. So even you think on companies that have a various need of projects, you know, going from mobile to web applications to backends, you know, you may need different under running OS systems or, you know, needs to run that yeah. project. And so you can get that specific environment for your developers. Well, rather than having to buy a PC and a Mac for your devs, because they need to develop, do some development on a Mac, some development on a PC, just having dev boxes, Mm -hmm. And really, almost nothing installed on the on the local workstation. Then, like, yeah, arguably, yeah. you have more compute available in the cloud than you have on the desktop. Yeah. And just yeah. to be clear, a dev box, we're talking a VM in the cloud somewhere that you use for development. Well, it's, you said AVD, you mean Azure Virtual Desktop. So rather than you owning the VM, this is a service that does the virtual desktop stuff. Yep. Okay. Yep. And so does and this um, does this work differently if you're a remote or offshore developer on a team as if you're in house? I mean, is there, are there any other considerations there for, for ADE? Well, that's the glorious part of it is, is no, is you can come up with a solution that works for all those scenarios. And so we talk about that velocity coming in from a business standpoint as well, is you have a way to build out an environment for all those scenarios. You know, and COVID kind of threw that all out going remote, kind of yeah. made that all first class, like, oh, we need to make sure we manage this. And so, no, like, like I mentioned, you know, if you are a startup engineer, and you're the solo engineer, you can set up DevBox. So you can you got to think ahead and scale because eventually as you bring more people in, this scenario will work for them, you know, handling from a DevBox perspective. Bringing in remote developers, same thing. They, they have their access that's set from Dev Center. They log in. It's in that Azure DevBox where mm -hmm. they can then access the code repositories where you can have that kind of lock down that security. So they can't just take it and walk away. Yeah as well as consultants. One feature I'm waiting for is for Microsoft to change the laws of physics so everybody's in the same time zone. Can you guys do that? Yeah. <laughs> Coming from an experience of corporate foreign exchange around the world, I can understand the, the pain of time management oh, and yeah. aligning that. 
Well, and presumably you can run Microsoft DevBox on in any Azure data center. So if you do have offshore devs, they don't have to run in the Azure data center as close as you. They run to the Azure data center as close to them. Yep. Yep. Brings that, you know, lowers that latency and brings that developer velocity up. Yeah. Nice. Well, at the same time, you do have control and you're also maintaining standards on configuration. And like, there's a bunch of advantages to doing that way. Um, in exchange for, you've got to figure out how to sell all this stuff up and you're paying by the hour. Yes. And that's the key to that like, consumption base. Like we can have scale down to idle or scale down to zero for these dev boxes too. So you're not paying for that usage over the weekend or whenever these developers may not be working. And that's kind of a cost savings perspective too of that. So. You know, when you go on vacation for two weeks, we don't have to pay for your machine for two weeks, right. so to speak. How do dev boxes work with mobile development? Are we forced to use emulators or can we use local devices? You know, to be honest, I don't know at the moment. Um, I know with .NET MAUI coming out with a lot of new technologies in that kind of hybrid phone development, um, I would assume looking down to being native devices is key, you know, uh. for that kind of testing production based application. I mean, at the minimum, you could go through the hockey app pipeline and push it onto a device. Yeah. I don't know how fast that is. I have used a USB over network tool to that I installed on my VM and my local machine that sort of passed through uh, over USB access to my phone, my local phone. It only worked on Android. Apple's a little more persnickety about stuff like that. Um, and it also just takes more time, right? Yeah. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah, I think that... The- you may have to push through the build pipeline to get on a device yeah. when it's a remote instance like that. Now, I mean, there's an upside to that, which is it's the same build process that you would do to go push to the store and so mm-hmm. on. So it's kind of legit. It's just a question of how long it takes. Like you can't beat USB cable plugged into phone sitting in front of you uh-huh. on your desktop. Uh-huh. But when we're already struggling for, you know, devol- developer velocity for mobile. Yeah, and I, I would assume the evolution goes that route, right? The hybrid phone development is has been growing over the years. You know, Dot Maui has made that a first class citizen. Um, you know, we're to the point too where you don't necessarily need to build these out in native languages. But uh, yeah, I, I could see that going heavily into the future. But I was I was laughing. My friends are talking about dev boxes. Like you can now kind of change the world from your grandma's Pentium two machine if you have a modern <laughs> browser on it, right? Because right? you don't need that type of compute. Yeah. And so it, it opens up all kinds of possibilities. You know, when you think about that. And I I mean I use the term hockey app, but that's not even a thing anymore. I th- I think it's just called mobile apps now as a service inside of Azure. That's supposed to be all of those. You know, sign on integration, uh, push services, that kind of thing. Yeah, it, it's been a bit since I've been in it. I know uh, I used Cordova and PhoneGap back in the day when I was doing some of my hybrid developments. And I just old remember school. old school. I remember having multiple laptops and iPads and tablets. Oh, yeah. And you had to like link them remotely, and that connection would always break. And you're wondering why you're not getting the latest bits on the device. And you know, it's it's been exciting to see, from my perspective, like .NET MAUI coming in and in that evolution of that stack. And when I think, you know, if I'm not doing anything that I need a native access to the phone, oh. hybrid phone application is where I first would look. I love hybrid. And, and .NET, yeah, mobile it's, apps. It's, love talk about you know being able to use your C sharp skill set. Again, I'm a C sharp developer, hmm. and uh, just being able to open up a project and get going quickly. Yeah, and then their hybrid integration with Blazor and bringing that into from that web tech, it's talk about agility there. It's so right? good. And it's it's been fantastic, and it just keeps getting better. Yeah, I'm just not though that we're all the way there yet. No, no. I mean, recently they just released the uh, like media elements to the to .NET Maui where you can actually stream right. video files. Right. And so I think that's a big heavy, you know, blocker for a while because there's a lot of applications that utilize that medium. Uh-huh. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I, I, there's a lot of heat growing behind it, a lot of momentum too. So it's exciting to see. Well, and, you know, my better know framework about um, Apple Safari is encouraging too. And uh, uh, a lot more helpful than people realize for um, allowing, uh, allowing people to go down that path of progressive web applications without restrictions which we've been having to put up with to this point love it i'm going to kind of talk back about this velocity too for a developer you know with modern day clouds it's it's coming in a point too where you're involved in infrastructure whether you like it or not the cloud 
And who manages that from an, think of it from a company perspective, who's managing the cloud and those costs yeah. and, and the worries they may have. I've never met any CFOs like, ah, I don't care where our spend goes, just do what you need to do. We want to build a product. Yeah. You know, they always have some sort of handholds on it. And so there are various steps we can take to this cloud governance perspective for developers mm -hmm. that may not directly relate, you know, something as simple as like Azure policies. Right. And being able to put in policies so we're not deploying in random uh, unapproved regions or we have certain SKUs uh, allowable. So I think you could code to that manually. I'm sorry, did you say Azure policy was simple? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Once you, you know, you, you learn the learning curve. <laughs> <laughs> Relatively. You know, like it's easy once I know it. Yeah. But but it's kind of a, one of those layers, right? You have that Azure policy built in to help guardrail. I always think of it as the bumper lanes on like, if you're ever going bowling and you ever popped up those bumper lanes to make sure you don't gutter ball your, you know, on your role. Yeah. And that's kind of the same things we're doing here in the cloud for the developer. Um, and it prevents, you know, it helps the business. Like I said, it prevents uh, offset costs. Uh, Azure tagging is another thing on top of Azure policy where we can monitor and maintain what resources are actually being built out in the cloud. And so if you have a certain scenario in your business about, uh, you know, um, cash, you know, chargebacks for infrastructure, you, know, you manage, you, you offer subscriptions to your clients. You can now manage that and, and know what's going on there. And that brings in developer velocity and you know, knowing what people, what your developers are building out and then tagging that and knowing where it's sitting. Right. Um, again, another thing it's automated through that dev center too of building out these environments through that infrastructure's code is we can set all those up. And so you can pop up for one developer, 14 sandbox environments and everyone's comfortable where they're at because we have the security around it. We have the networking around uh -huh. it. We have the RBAC permissions around it for a user and those interacting with it. Mm -hmm. The role-based uh, access control. Yes, yeah, so the role-based access control for users, whether you know they need to read those uh, resources or actually contribute to them and interact with them, deploy to them. So, I mean, part of those policies would be this stuff turns off after work is over. Like, how do we think I'm looping us back to the beginning there where it's like, hey, don't leave all these things on. We now have the dev center. We have app center. Like we have all these great tools, but they're also going to help us clean up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And we can set those. One of those features, too, is from these projects when they're completed, you know, we built them out. They're running that project's done. We commit the code to that uh, the main branch to go to production. When that project is done, we end it, it'll you remove that infrastructure too. Mm -hmm. So you don't have those orphaned resources yeah, just sitting there, you know, with cost or potentially just, I, I see a, a, a tactic. A lot of people say, well, if it scales down to zero, we just leave it because it doesn't charge us money. Uh, but right. then you just, you have a mess there. You have a huge cattle herd of cattle sitting yeah. around not being used, you know? So. Well, I like the idea of using tagging to say, this is actually a dev resource. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if no dev is currently going on, this sh probably shouldn't be here anymore. Yeah. yeah. Well, and even when we build out those resources from devs, uh, the dev center, it builds it out in a resource group too. So it kind of already groups them yeah. together as well. So it's just easy to organize and maintain, especially if you're working through the portal. One of the hardest things that I've had to do in the portal is go through some old resources and wonder, is anybody else besides me using this? This was like something, mm -hmm. I can't remember what this was. And you're afraid to delete the resource because, yeah, yeah. What was that? I, I, hasn't been used in two years. Is it still right. accessible? Yeah. You delete it and then production goes down. Yeah. <laughs> Easiest way to get a phone call when you're feeling yeah. lonely. Yeah. Just, yeah. just delete a couple of resources and wait. <laughs> Look, they love me again. <laughs> Job security. <laughs> you missed That's me, great. didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> just for one little right click stop. There we are. Here yeah. comes the love. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, as funny as that, that joke is, it, it's true, though, how easy it is to build out and how easy it is to ruin something, yeah. or, you know, stub your toe. Well, yeah. And, and that's, I think, one thing, too, with this automation that it's not only to have that velocity move forward, but also to make sure you don't hurt yourself or your team as you're moving forward, which is going to increase that velocity as well. Yeah. Brian, can you share any um, training or documentation or video resources that we can point our listeners to if they want to learn more about this? Yeah, yeah. I'll send you some links. I know uh, John Saville, he's a cloud solution architect as well. Uh, he has a fantastic YouTube series, really breaks down in the details a lot of what goes on in Azure, but he addresses kind of the infrastructure's code and DevOps perspective 
uh, specifically. Uh, he's a fantastic resource for those. Great. Cool. I know who John is. The big guns guy. <laughs> and what's next for you, Brian? What's in your inbox? You know, for me, I, I've always been struggled to kind of keep on uh, a blog and, you know, podcasts. I always like the ideas. And so I, the consistency has been hard to keep up. So I, I'm kind of aiming for starting to write a book wow. kind of focus on leadership and DevOps. Don't do it. Oh, yeah. Sorry. That's <laughs> little book, little book, right? Did you say that out loud, Richard? Yeah. <laughs> sorry. But, you know, wherever my, my journey leads me to help mm. continue on working with the development community, I, I really yeah. enjoy I love watching young developers, new people in the field, and just have that light bulb go off. Right. You're like, oh, look at the potential, you know? And uh, so whatever it means, whether it's conferences or, or more you know, podcasts like this, right. I would love to be a part of and help. Great. Awesome. Hey, thanks for uh, spending this time with us. It sounds sounds like really good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to checking it out. And we'll talk to you next time on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Plop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a transmitter band by the FCC. Yes, I'm a... Uh...